I'm John Batchelor, and this is The John Batchelor Show. The wide open seas, the high seas, the references to the Spanish main, to the adventure, the piracy, the romance. Take a sea voyage. Or, uh, alternately, go on one of the cruise ships and travel around the Caribbean or the South Atlantic or to Alaska. All of that is part of the world of progress and civilization. But there's another story through the glass darkly. We go into the Outlaw Oceans. This is a series of articles published by the New York Times. The author, Ian Urbina, I welcome him. He's an investigative reporter for the New York Times. And I want to begin on something I did not know existed, but it's very logical. If you know the story of Captain Phillips, it was a very successful movie about a ship being overrun by pirates. The rescue, thanks to the President of the United States and the intervention of a very brave people. And you've heard of the fact that many nations maintain a fleet, a flotilla, off of Somalia, off of the uh, the Horn of Africa, to protect shipping that wants to make its way into the Red Sea and the Suez Canal to Mediterranean. But have you heard of floating armories? Ian, a very good evening to you. You begin your presentation of floating armories in the Gulf of Oman, I believe. A floating armory. These are outside limits, and there does not seem to be any regulation as far as I can see. What do the floating armories present? What is their business plan? A very good evening to you. The armories are interesting, and they sort of emerged um, as a result of two um, trends. One trend was uh, the rise of, as you say, sort of Captain Phillips-style Somali piracy, and that was a big turning point. It um, peaked in 2008, 2009. And really, it was the first time in maritime history that governments uh, around the world essentially told uh, merchant marines that it was um, appropriate, even advisable, for them to arm up uh, and have arms and armed guards uh, because these governments, their navies, were not equipped to um, battle the pirates. So a huge maritime security industry emerged, a lot of ships with guys with guns uh, on the one hand. At the same time, there was an opposite trend, and that was sort of the post-9-11 trend. Um, that was a sort of anti-immigration trend, and that occurred on land, and there was increasing restrictions in ports, um, nervousness about terrorism, nervousness about other sorts of um, undocumented immigrants. Um, and so ports became stricter about the arrival of um, armed guards or the presence of weapons in their national waters or on, in their ports. And that presented a problem. You had ships out there with armed guards, but you had more ports, very few ports that would actually allow um, these guns to arrive. Um, and so the solution you know, became these floating armories, which are these essentially these uh, ships that serve as both a hotel and a weapons depot, and they float right <clears throat> excuse me, at the line between the national and international waters, which is uh, 12 miles is that line, 12 miles from shore. And these armories float 13 miles or further, so they're in international waters. Um, and um, that's where you leave your armed guards, and that's where you leave your guns as you go unload your cargo. You leave your armed guards and your guns there. Can you rent from them? Is it a, a, a situation where you can hire armed guards if you're going into a particularly rough passage, say the Gulf of Oman or going east towards Bangladesh, and then you return them someday or you on your return trip you bring them back? Are these, in other words, are these paladins? Are these guns for hire anywhere? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in the beginning of this niche market, it was really... Um, anything goes. And uh-huh. so you had commercial ships renting guns, renting guys with guns. Um, and like you say, if you're heading from point A to point B and you're a large fuel tanker or cargo ship, um, these armories would be positioned um, on one side of the hot zone, as they call it, the sort of danger area. And you would rent your guards, you'd pick them up, you'd go through the rough neighborhood. And then on the other side, there were you know, sort of partner armories, and you drop them off, the guards off there, and you continue on your way. Uh, and there was a sort of whole market. Um, and before the armories, it was even more crazy because a lot of uh, companies simply would dump their guns overboard. 
because it was cheaper to just buy new guns in Kenya or Djibouti or wherever um, and than it was to get hit with fines or to have to hire um, guards. But the armories emerged as sort of a more practical solution. And like you say, you know, the, the guards just wait there for their next deployment um, and they get picked up and travel back and forth. Ian is describing the organized part. Now we plunge into chaos. There is a video accompanying Ian's piece on the floating armories and weapons at sea that is spectacularly grotesque. It is the evidence of mass murder. However, it is unclear who did it and why and what the event being presented is supposed to tell people because it was recorded on a video phone. As I understand from your uh, investigation, Ian, you put together that one of the boats involved, I believe there were four fishing boats, was the Chun E-217 out of Taiwan. What do we believe we're seeing on the video? So there are two schools of thought on what we're seeing there. Um, the, the, the perspective of uh, the owner of one of the vessels that was there, the one you mentioned, uh, we interviewed that um, CEO, and he had spoken with the captain of the ship that was at the scene, uh, and also the perspective of the Taiwanese authorities. Uh, and this is pure speculation, but right. they all believe that what occurred was um, these were pirates who had been repelled, and what you see on the video is the pirates in the water sort of clinging to wreckage, uh, and the person who's shooting at them and ultimately shoots all four of them uh, is essentially finishing the job. Um, and, you know, the alternate perspective is that, um, you know, piracy has become a bit of a pretext for other sorts of score settling, uh, and um, it's just as likely, uh, so say these, you know, other analysts who've watched the video for us and um, that, you know, this was a dispute between a small fishing boat and, a, and, a, and some larger fishing boats, uh, or um, these were sort of petty thieves that were caught stealing bait from a large tuna longliner, um, or this could be a, a mutiny scenario where crew had um, been thrown overboard and what you're witnessing is the uh, completion of that act. There are a lot of other scenarios that were put forward as equally as likely. What we're witnessing then is a large number of people, not just a small number of people, aware of this event, and yet there is no reckoning, there is no clarity, there's no transparency, giving the impression that this is routine, or at least routine in the lives of the men on those boats. This is South East Pacific, I believe, uh, and you you say that languages spoken on the video are Malay and Vietnamese and Filipino, perhaps, and that part of the world seems especially lawless. Is that discontinuous with, say, the South Atlantic, that when you enter into the Malay Straits or when you enter into the archipelago out there, you're in another planet entirely? Is there a difference, Ian? There is, yeah, and you, you, you're quite right. I mean, there are places that heat up and others that cool down. So, for example, right now, the numbers off the coast of Somalia are very low. The violence there is very low. Um, and three years ago, that was not the case, four years ago. Whereas the South China Sea um, is extremely violent, um, and it historically has not been uh, the, the, the amount of violence, the amount of, the amount of piracy, the amount of murder that occurs there um, has tended to not bubble up to the international awareness um, because these are national waters, um, these are smaller boats, uh, these are largely third world victims, um, and the finances involved are not usually the big companies, Western companies. And so those waters have been dangerous and violent for a long time, but they are extremely so in recent years. The violence there also, you have some stats that you've achieved from the data uh, the data office of the Naval Intelligence, an organization called Oceanus Live and Risk Intelligence point to hundreds, thousands of assaults in this area. And my sense is that if you want lawlessness, this, I mean, it begins to feel like I'm reading uh, Conrad again that what we've wandered into is a story from the 19th century about whalers or, or sea voyages over long distances that just disappear. Is that the sense that you got from that part of Asia, that people just vanish and you never hear of them again? 
Yeah, I think what's striking is, on the one hand, it is a huge space, the high seas, right? right? The planet is two-thirds water, and most of that water is international waters, high seas. Um, But it's extremely sprawling. And while there are a lot of ships, you know, on any given moment um, floating on these waters, um, they're spread out. So by dint of the expanse, um, boats stay away from each other for the for the most part. So um, you know a lot of commerce and a lot of activity occurs without event, without violence, without all the things we describe. I think the thing that's striking is that when crime or violence are, does occur, um, it's the lack of accountability uh, or oversight. Uh, or any sort of law enforcement, not to mention any real laws that um, have teeth um, to deal with that crime. That's what was most striking to me. We're going to turn back to the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, where there is a great deal of civilization and traffic and be be uh, amazed by the lawlessness there. But one detail, when you visited the floating army in the Gulf of Oman, and I believe you were with a colleague, at any point, did you feel threatened when you got on board, Ian, or was it a was it a sinister atmosphere? It wasn't actually. I mean, that, that's also what's striking. It's sort of the banality of of these places. On the one hand, um, while you know what can happen, um, we were on uh, two different armories. We visited two different armories. We spent the bulk of our time on one armory which was on the upper end. It was the MNG Resolution. It's a British uh, company, and it's uh, Kits and Nevis flagged, and it's on the upper end of standards. Um, It was really well run. Um, It had full-time security guarding the weapons and sort of managing the men, Um, and it was as it was on the better end um and a lot of these guys that do this work are sort of three four tours of duty in afghanistan or iraq largely british australian american ex-military um are the team leaders and then the lower team members are largely south asian uh, indian sri lankan filipino uh, some greeks um and they were older guys for the most part it was all men um, most of them were over 40 uh, and they're just sort of punching a clock. Um, on the other hand, you know, the the second army we visited was the opposite end of the the spectrum, and it was uh, a roach uh, infested, um, you know, uh, cramped. Uh, they had no uh, security of their own, so it's a huge floating military depot with weapons of all sorts and no guards that are there just to guard the weapons. Um, there are guards there as guests. Um, and so, and th- th- there was um, real tension uh, from that vessel. And the tension usually emerged from these guards who um, are cut off from their families, cut off from the world. They have no internet or spotty internet, um, no phone privileges. Um, and they're there for, you know, uh, a month, a month and a half. Um, food is awful. Um, this one was vermin infested. Uh, some of the guys lift up their shirts and showed they'd been just eaten alive by bed bugs. Um, and the companies pay them a, a minimal rate of 30, 40 bucks a day. Um, and they don't know when they're getting off or where they're going next or whether they're going to get home. So um, that really shows a real sort of pent up anger uh, among these guys. There's a fair amount of steroid use. Um, and so they're, they're volatile, the, the, worst, the worst facilities. I'm speaking with Ian Urbina, the New York Times investigative reporter. We're headed to the outlaw ocean on the South Atlantic next. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Ian Urbina of The New York Times, the author of a series of stories about outlaw ocean, the lawlessness and the anarchy, on also what you'd have to say is part of the now crisis worldwide recognized of people disowned by crisis, by weather, by war, by longing, uh, and, and especially out of Africa, 
Ian tells the story of two men, one Cobello, who is now deceased, and the other one, Amdalwa. Ian will correct my pronunciation, who is still with us, although disappointed and is now back to Africa, who drift from country to country, originally from their Tanzania. Ian picks up the story when they board a reefer, that's the name of it, named Donna Liberta, which is existing on the margin of civilization at this point, doing work for hire owned by a Greek company. Ian, these two men, uh, one now deceased, one Amdalua, uh, still with us, are they representative of these stowaways, or is this an extraordinary uh, story? It reads like the first chapter of a novel. Yeah, it is. These two guys are somewhat representative of the stowaway world. You know, they, these are sort of the hobos of the sea. Right. And they're largely um, uh, uh, very um, desperate um, uh, people um, who are looking to escape either war or poverty or, or um, something else. And they're typically men. They're typically young. And there are some places in the world where um, they um, coalesce um, because there's more access to ships in those places. And Cape Town, South Africa, is one of those places, and that's where these two Tanzanians went. And there's a small sort of shanty town near the port where a lot of stowaways um, are, and they share stories and tactics and attempts uh, to get on these ships and hopefully go someplace better. Uh, and these two guys um, did just that, and they ended up on um, a pretty horrific ship uh, that eventually put them on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Right, abandoned them to die. It's accident, fate, and their prayers that were answered when they were rescued by a fisherman. However, Ian follows the story of the Donna Liberta that abandoned them. It's owned by a very prominent Greek shipper out of Chios, I believe, the island of Chios. And you investigated who might be have been the captain who abandoned them and who made those decisions. But you were not successful because the authorities who have those names wouldn't give them out. Why not? So there's a fair amount of secrecy in the shipping industry. Um, it's an industry that um, guards um, uh, it, its own fairly well. Um, it's also an industry that's sort of layered, um, uh, uh, and it's international. And so um, you have a ship, uh, you take a, an example ship, uh, it may be owned by a um, Greek company, um, uh, you know, captained by an Italian, flagged to Liberia, crewed by Filipinos, Indonesians, um, and the company that owns it is registered in Panama. You know, right, and this right. is a very typical scenario, and that more or less describes um, the Dalla Verta. And when you have a case like that, getting information out of anyone becomes what we, you know, we mention in the story, and I heard from sources, is the maritime merry-go-round. And it's essentially this runaround you get where any question you ask, um, you, know, you get point to... One agency, the International Maritime Organization, they point you to Interpol, and it points you to the flagging registry, and the flagging registry points you to the corporate owner, which is the P.O. box, and they point you back to, you know, if they answer your calls at all, they point you back to the, the U.N. agency, the IMO, and around you go. And you never really get answers, and, and we sort of rode that married merry-go-round. Uh, the Donna Liberta's evidence of there being commerce in, at the margins of a civilization, but because of the big carriers, the big ships, the cargo uh, carriers, uh, the Donna Liberta has to work what looks to be uh, the illegality side, uh, drugs, smuggling, perhaps human trafficking, all of that. And that, too, is at the margin, Ian, if I understand. It knows that it's outside the reach of authorities. There are too many contradictory authorities. And that wa that's why it gets away with oil sludge dumping, very well documented. That's why it gets away with, with everybody, anybody. There's no marshal, is, is my generality here. There's no marshal at all for reefers like the Donna Liberta, and never will be. That's right. I mean, it's it's a huge jurisdiction with no cops, um, and so um, uh, so much happens out there. Um, and even if there are laws that um, forbid it, there's no one enforcing. There's very few um, uh, players who actually enforce those laws. Did you get the sense in your investigations, and they will continue, that you were asking questions that were best left unasked? Were you treated as an outsider, an interloper? We have about thirty seconds here. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a, a very insular community, um, and uh, they don't like reporters, um, and so um, they're not um, handing information over um, willingly. The information is gripping. Ian Urbina for Outlaw Ocean. We've spoken of the floating armories, and we've certainly spoken of the lawlessness, the mass murder on a video that's attached to the series, and then the Donna Liberta, which has a new name, its new owners, a new captain, and it's up to its old tricks question mark. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. <laughs>